Hey there, it's time for VoiceOver Body Shop, and our guest this week is David Arrigo Jr., the voice right of there. Ferb. Yeah, he's there, honestly. Anyway, we got lots of cool stuff to talk about. If you've got a question for David, throw it in the Facebook chat room. I know Jeff Holman is sitting in there waiting with bated breath, whatever the heck that means, to write down your question and get it to us so we can ask him a little bit later on in the show. But we got great stuff tonight. So stay tuned for VoiceOver Body Shop coming up right now. From the outer reaches, they came. Bearing the knowledge of what it takes to properly record your voiceover audio. And together, from the center of the VO universe, they bring it to you now. George Widom, the engineer to the VO stars, a Virginia Tech grad with the skills to build, set up, and maintain the professional VO studios of the biggest names in VO today. And you, Dan Leonard, the voiceover home studio master, a professional voice talent with the knowledge and experience to help you create a professional sounding home VO studio. And each week, they allow you into their world, bringing you talks with the biggest names in the voiceover world today, letting you ask your questions, and giving you the latest information to make the most of your voiceover business. Welcome to VoiceOver Body Shop. VoiceOver Body Shop is brought to you by VoiceOverEssentials.com, home of Harlan Hogan Signature Products, Source Elements, remote studio connections for everyone, VoiceActorWebsites.com, where your VO website isn't a pain in the butt. VOHeroes.com, become a hero to your clients with award-winning voiceover training. JMC Demos, when quality matters. And VoiceOver Extra, your daily resource for VO success. And now, live to drive, from their super secret clubhouse and studio in Sherman Oaks, California, here are the guys. Hey, hi there. I'm Dan Leonard. I'm George Whittem. And this is VoiceOver Body Shop or VO BS. We miss the crowd. We, we miss having a, a studio full of people yelling BS. You know, but uh, we, what do. Are we, gonna do? But, we do. Is there a dog in there at least that we could no, get? The no, 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 no. Mishka and Ari went back in the house. So. All right. Yeah. Anyway, no so it's it's good to be back live with you guys. And George, it's good to have you home. You were off in the outback somewhere. Yep. Breaking all the rules. Don't go traveling during COVID. Um, <laughs> actually, the secret is the best time to travel. Yeah. Well, good. To um, yeah. No, it, we had a great time. Went up, took a little flew to Salt Lake and then did a big loop up through Yellowstone and back again. Yeah. And uh, we saw a bison wow. and thousands of bison and we got there's a picture of one i took no that is not from a website i actually took that with my actually with a camera i borrowed from a good friend i, oh. <laughs> I put a post <laughs> online saying anybody want to send their camera to yellowstone and i'll i'll take pictures with it and somebody actually wow. lent me there Very so nice. i had a real camera yeah um, but yeah it was magical being there in summer, having it go from 90 to 25 in a day Whoa. and snow was shocking and interesting. And it was really cool. If you're going to go to Yellowstone, it's a great time to go. Now that, that, this, is, this, is, this is mind-blowing. This is called what? Uh, Grand, I think that it's part of the Grand Prismatic Spring area. And it's just, yeah, it's, it's a gurgling, steaming, living uh it's most bizarre park and, and it's one that makes you want to come back because things move around. You yeah. know, you come back in five years, that thing that was always going off might be dead and something else is happening the next time. Cause things are constantly changing and really remarkable place. My girlfriend, Firza, she lives here. She came here from Iran eight years ago. It was the one place she knew she wanted to go someday before even getting to the U S and we finally got to go and it was, awesome i guess it's all downhill from here then no, uh, no. <laughs> yeah, well that that's it yeah. <laughs> she'll, ah, have, to go, there's, she'll there's... have to go to yosemite for a fourth time oh, she's yeah. been there three times and i haven't been there yet yeah <laughs> it's, it's amazing you know what we have here in this country and going to visit there anyway we have a great guest for ourselves tonight uh if you're a fan of phineas and ferb which believe it or not i am because my kids watch that stuff you know 
They're like, by proxy know. are really, really a fan, Dan. I, I thought it was cute. I thought it was well written. <laughs> but a movie just came out recently, and the guy that's playing Ferb is our guest, David Arrigo Jr. David, welcome to the show. Welcome to Voiceover hey, Body hey. Shop. Thanks for having me. Great to have you in here. And uh, I haven't seen it yet, so you know, don't you know, don't be a spoiler. Or anything, I will not ruin anything except to say that it is awesome. I well, I would <laughs> hope so. Uh, anyway, uh, so. You, you've had a very interesting career. Now, you, you arrived in the voiceover world after a very successful early career in New York City. How did you start in showbiz and what have you uh, I actually started in showbiz after a concert that I went to with my dad when I was a kid. I went to a Springsteen concert with my dad who's from New Jersey. And I'm pretty sure if you don't like Springsteen and you're from New Jersey, they don't let you come home. Which tour was <laughs> Um <laughs> Huh? Was that the Born in the USA tour? Or, uh... Uh, I can't remember. I, I was 12 or so, 13 okay. maybe. Right. And I looked at my dad's face and he had this big grin on his face. And I literally that day said, that's what I want to do for people. And um, that shifted all of my focus. I thought I wanted to be a comic book artist when I was a kid, stuff like that. But when, uh, when school started up in the fall, I started taking uh, choir, drama, whatever I could so that I could... Uh, develop those skills uh got a degree in theater from the university of montana in missoula um and then i just was pursuing musical theater like gangbusters uh did some summer stock did some regional theater down in arizona right after school um for a couple of years uh and then moved to new york and i was fortunate enough to work for disney cruise line and uh do some off broadway stuff some off off stuff uh, never did break that Broadway thing, but always had fun auditions. And eventually that all sort of led me to a manager and that uh, manager got me a meeting with um, Paradigm Agency for on-camera commercial stuff. And after talking to Doug, their on-camera agent for like 45 minutes and talking to him about how much I loved doing Avenue Q regionally and, and things like that, doing the voices, uh, he was like, just you come with me. And he sort of took me by the shoulders and walked me over to the other side of the office to a guy named Matt Smith and sat me down and said, you guys talk. And they sort of picked me up as a, as a sort of freelancing client or, or a hip pocket client. And I started getting these auditions and I was like, uh Oh, <laughs> this is cool. And that got me involved in uh, picking up a, a mic so that I could rehearse at home and try and try and do stuff and, and learn and uh, listen to Talking Tunes podcast and and um, VO Buzz Weekly and go to D Bradley Baker's website I want to be a voice actor .com and pick up uh, Tara Platt and Yuri Lowenthal's book uh, Voice Over Voice Actor. I like that book so much that I'm actually a testimonial in the second edition. I just took all of that information and was like get in my brain and started pushing directly toward voiceover because through that I wound up with an audition for an animated feature that was a dubbing project and I just woke up that day smiling took the subway grinning did the th did the audition beaming left glowing and I got on the phone with my dad once again talking to my dad and I said I think I found the thing I'm supposed to be doing. <laughs> and, um, wow, sorry, there's some very loud noises. Bowling. <laughs> <where I am>. um, <laughs> maybe some of the found next the door is making a steel drum. <laughs> one of those. <laughs> exactly. Um, I think I found the thing I'm supposed to be doing. And I was able to look backwards, too, and find that, like, I was spending all of my money that was sort of discretionary income on figuring this thing out. And I wasn't spending anything on dance classes or voice lessons for singing or, or any of the acting stuff for theater. It was all voiceover centric. And I was like, ah, if I follow where I'm spending my money, it is very clear that this is what I want to do. Um, and that, that just got me in the door, I did a lot of dubbing stuff in New York uh, because that's a lot of what's available out there, not a lot of original animation. Um, there's a fair amount of commercial stuff, promo, 
all that. But I mean, promo, is, as you guys know, is so possible to do pretty much anywhere if you've got the right yeah. uh, gig. Yeah, it's um, still a small cadre of people who really dominate that part. Right. Yeah. So, um, so having listened to Talking Tunes, having listened to VO Buzz Weekly, I said, I got to move to LA. And luckily my wife was like, yeah. I don't mind moving to LA <laughs> and long- she's a personal chef who specializes in vegan and vegetarian cooking. Uh, so she's a, sounds she's like a good move. Yeah. yeah. This she's is a, a fine place for her to be. <laughs> um, which yeah, that is not what she sounds like, by the way. Um, <laughs> is that your Shit's Creek voice? Who's the guy oh. on Shit's Creek, man? Ew, like- David. Ew. David, yeah. yeah. We definitely like to watch the show and congratulations, Annie, on your Emmy. <laughs> exactly. Um, awesome, man. Yeah. <laughs> so when did you come out here? So we moved out here in uh, the fall of 2016. Uh, I was lucky enough to sign with SBV Talent, who were my ideal agency, uh, a wonderful woman named Mary McDonald Lewis, who has been in the industry for a while, gave me a great reference to them. And uh, they picked me up in December of 17. And I've stayed with them because... I love them. (laughs) (laughs) That that helps if you love your agency. It does. It really does. I trust them implicitly. And, uh, you know, I think that that's very important when when you're an actor as well is to to have that relationship where if you feel like you can communicate with your representation, and I totally feel like I can communicate with my representation, that is really awesome as opposed to being afraid to reach out yeah that, that's great if you're just joining us where have you been uh <laughs> our guest is david arrigo jr who's uh currently uh starring as the voice of ferb who doesn't really say a whole lot in the new uh, phineas and ferb movie and he's been part doing... of the irony about loving the role <laughs> I, it makes it easy i suppose but uh if you've got a question for him throw it in the facebook chat room where jeff holman is standing by and we will get that question to him in a little bit but as you listen to him you're gonna go i want to know more about this i know i want to know about how he did this well which is why i get to ask these questions as well like uh now you've you've done a fair amount of animation work i see you you're in detective pikachu and i was cubone yes yeah and and a number of <laughs> other things now did your agency say you know you're good at this and we're gonna push you or did you say i want to do this and you're gonna find this for me how did that all work um i actually think there was a little bit of of skepticism about me doing animation initially because you got to think about it logically for for an agency to sort of break someone who's relatively unknown into animation that's a lot harder work than to get somebody into commercial stuff, right? Because the the turnover is just not the same. The the opportunity for things to come along in commercial, not a campaign per se, but even just a one-off, right? Like how often do you hear the same customer on that McDonald's commercial? Mm. Pretty rare. Yeah. You get the same uh, uh, announcer maybe, but, you know, the person who's like, Hey, is that uh, is that the new quarter pounder with cheese? That person rotates, or it's so much easier to think that you can make money off of someone with commercial, uh, or with someone. I don't want to make the agencies sound predatory um, with commercials than it is with animation, right? Because there are so many incredibly talented people in the business who are able to do not just one voice, not just five voices, not just 20 voices. So if you develop a relationship with those people, why wouldn't you wanna keep using them? So there was a little bit of, I think, eh, we'll, we'll, we'll take him on and we'll, we'll see if it works for animation. But I made sure too that I expressed to them that this was not short game for me, mm-hmm. that, if they took me on, I will do what they tell me in terms of how do I meet people and improve my skills in this arena. But, you know, as I said, I think in the meeting, I didn't move here to cater. So (laughs) what I will do is as much work as I can to make this happen. And fortunately, uh, uh, a couple of things broke relatively early on and commercial was the first thing that I booked from them, it was a uh, like two months after I signed with them, I got this really great campaign for um, Cox Communications. 
and went into Bell Sound uh, or Bell Studios. Is it Bell Sound? I think it's Bell Sound. And did 11 TV commercials in one afternoon. And that was the first thing I booked through SBV. And I was like, I like it here. <laughs> yeah, that's always fun when they're like, by the way, can you do this one? And they start, they start handing out the scripts and like, yeah, I could do this one. Oh my yeah. gosh. That makes you want to stick around. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I think it also, it, it really did help me that I had the information from the podcasts and things like that. I wound up having a conversation with one of my agents uh, over drinks at a bar near the, near the uh, agency. And one of the things he said was, we were so surprised that someone so new to town had the insights into the industry that you had in our meeting. We didn't know how you knew certain things. <laughs> but what that showed us was that you had an investment in the career and in the field and in the history of it too. Right. I think it's so important to have a reverence for what came before so that you can also sort of know a little bit more of what's going to come. And I'm not saying that it makes you psychic, but you have access to trends and you, you can sort of accept that things come in cycles, right? Because you've seen it. Um, and what do they say? Knowing is half the battle. Right. Um, I also like to just mine from what I heard ages ago. Well, oh, this worked. This worked really well. Uh, oh, that kind of character was really popular for a while, but it's kind of fallen out of fashion right now or has for the last decade or so, maybe I can bring uh, uh, a tweaked version of that and capitalize because nobody's doing it. Yeah. I know it works. I know it has worked. Can I make it new again? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's fascinating how you know, a lot of people think, oh, I can get into animation. I can do funny voices, but it's not about doing funny voices. <laughs> it's about... Having, you know, being able to move characters and, and change who they are by changing tone and things like that, and then being able to maintain that. Throughout sustain the sustain it. Yeah. Right? Well, and beyond that, too, sort of a dirty little secret. You don't really have to sound all that different. You have to sound like you think differently. Right. That is so much more important than like, I can make my voice sound like this. <laughs> oh, but that guy has to sound like he thinks differently from the guy who says, I can make my voice sound like this. That's, when I would go into uh, the agency to do my auditions, uh, I would often ask our, our engineer, uh, hey, did those guys sound like they had different worldviews? Do they sound like they thought differently? Uh, which, shout out to you, Yvonne. I hope you're catching this, and I miss you. Um, and she was always very forthcoming and would let me know if they did or if they didn't, because that's, that's more important, right? You can, you can make two guys that sound exactly like me think completely differently, and you've got really great takes. Look at somebody like Lorenzo Music, right? Yeah. How much did he make use of essentially one sound? Yeah. yeah, that's right. Oh, this is Carlton, your doorman. Yep, <laughs> know, know that one well. So you 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 got this role. Somebody else was playing Ferb before. How did you get thrown into doing uh, this somewhat quiet character who just is more like turning his head and stuff like that? Right. Um, well, actually, that's one of my favorite things. He always said because like early on, people were like you don't talk much. Well, actually, and then they would just continue with the conversation and he kind of right. just got like, uh. <laughs> and then it, be, you know, obviously became that he was this sort of cool philosopher kind of guy. But um, when Dan and Swampy created uh, another show called Milo Murphy's Law, they always had this idea that it was taking place in Danville, um, which is where Phineas and Ferb lived. So they always had a mind or an eye toward uh, having a crossover episode. And uh, when it came time to do that at the top of season two, they asked the cast back, and I'm not sure exactly why uh, Thomas didn't 
return. I don't know if it was because he was busy or not interested. I, I have legitimately no idea. I'm sorry that I can't spill the tea there. Um, so what they did was they said, okay, well, we got to figure this out because you got to have a fur voice. And they sent out the auditions. Um, SBV sent it to me, uh, took a listen, regurgitated the sample to the best of my ability, uh, had my wife listen to it. And she said, well, if you don't get this one, I'm really confused about what your job is. <laughs> uh, so I was like, okay, I will, I will take that That's as a, a good weird vote sign. of confidence, but, uh, <laughs> uh, and I did another round of auditions after submitting it a couple weeks later and they, they hired me. And one of my favorite stories about that day is walking in and Dan Pavenmeyer going what before you say anything, are you from England? We all think you are, except Swampy, mm. who had, he's lived, he lived in England for a long time. Uh, and I said, oh, no, no, no. I'm, I'm from North Carolina and other places. If I wasn't thinking about it, I'd probably talk to you like this, because I grew up for a long time about an hour below Alabama. Uh, <laughs> and he was like, ah! <laughs> But then we we did it, and uh, that first session was essentially an ADR. They had scratched it in. I think Swampy had scratched it in because he's you know he's got pretty good facility with a with a an English dialect, which is an amazing uh, safety net when we do the sessions because I know that I can trust him uh, to call me out if I make mistakes or if it sounds wrong to the ear. Uh, that that trust is just so helpful. Absolutely. So I take it it was probably a lot of fun working on that. You know, oh, my goodness. Were, were you familiar with the, with the character or with Phineas and Ferb uh, beforehand? I was. I actually, I got turned on to the show back in 2012. I was doing a production of a show called The Happy Elf in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. And uh, The Happy <laughs> Elf was written by um, Harry Connick Jr. And we got to work with him, which was fantastic. And uh, a little bit of trivia. In the animated version, the character I played, uh, the happy elf, Yubi, was played by one of my idols, Rob Paulson. Ah. Um, so that was pretty cool. But I was doing a homestay during this job, and uh, there was a young man there who, uh, uh, it, was, it was his home, right? I was, his parents were hosting me, and he was just gaga over the moon for... Um, Phineas and Ferb and was like, you have to watch this thing. And I watched it and just fell in love with it. I watched tons of cartoons though. So it's not a surprise that I would love something that is so great. Um, <clears throat> I loved it so much that I actually wound up making Perry my text tone, that little <laughs> noise that he makes. And it has been my text tone on my iPhone since 2012. So it was meant to be essentially. Kind of. Yeah. It was one of those things that also, going back even further, when I was in college, I loved the movie um, uh, 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 Love Actually. And um, Thomas Brody Sangster was the kid in Love Actually. And Olivia Olsen was actually the girl that he falls in love with. Uh, so it's kind of funny that in, in Phineas and Ferb, they wound up getting paired together as well as Ferb and Vanessa, uh, at least toward the end of the, of the series. I think that's pretty confirmed. Cool. <laughs> Now, one of the other things, you know, we, we have a lot of people who watch your show who are you know, very interested in, you know, in, in your career and the stuff you're doing. But as voice actors, they may not necessarily understand some of the contractual things that have to go on when you're a voice actor. A lot of people, a lot of times it's just a handshake, you know, a virtual one most of the time. You know, it's like, will you do this for me? Yeah, sure. Fine. Here's how much I'm going to pay you. It. I take it you think that perhaps people should pay a little bit more attention to that, and why? I, I absolutely do. Um, I, you know, I, I can't speak too much to the handshake things. I do think that there are resources out there for, like, rate guides and things like that. Um, I, I don't know if you guys give people guidance on that kind of stuff, too, somewhere, but I mm -hmm. know that those resources are out there. But I will say, once you go union and once you're working on union contracts, I advocate to anyone that I know to get familiar with those contracts so that you know what can be asked of you, what you can expect in a session. Um, uh, 
and and you just find ways that you can then advocate for yourself and protect yourself and others uh, sometimes by by being intimately familiar with those contracts. I think being educated about what is expected of you, and I think this would go across the board, honestly, is is incredibly important. Before before I joined SAG-AFTRA, I did a couple of things for for friends uh, where I would do a commercial or something like that. And I quickly learned that like, I need to establish some uh, guidelines, some rules, uh, even as simple as like, pickups will be charged at this rate for blah, so that what I'm not getting is someone writing a version of like a uh, an online spot, right? And then having to record five more versions of it because they hadn't sorted out what they were trying to say and not getting compensated. Right. So making sure that you sort of get yourself a workflow, right? To If you're going to have those handshake deals, make sure that you're not letting people take advantage of you um, and make sure that you have something that they're going to have up front and agree to so that you can point to that when they're saying, oh, but come on, it's only changing like four sentences out of the whole thing. It's going to take you 10 minutes. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That, mm -hmm. and, that, and that does happen. I, our friend Connie Terwilliger is always talking about when you're dealing in this situation, always look at ears and eyeballs. Uh, who is it that's watching? Where is it going to be watched? That sort of thing. And really get an understanding for what it is that you're doing and who you're doing it for and where it's going. Is it going to be broadcast? Is it going to be just on the internet? And what are the guarantees that you're, that's where it's going to be and they're not going to take it and put it somewhere else and not compensate you for it. Yeah. I mean, I lean, I lean very heavily on my union for those kinds of protections. Um, I'm somebody who, who stops doing non-union work um, just because I, uh, I, I, I I couldn't conscientiously continue doing it once I was a member, um, but I, I know that there's there's all kinds of reasons that people do it, and I'm not trying to vilify anyone. But for me, as a military brat, uh, I came up with sort of that structure and the, the uh, integrity factor really built into me. So with Global Rule 1 stating, don't work without the benefit of the contract, I lean very heavily on on the union to be like, oh... I don't have to worry about where it's going. If it goes there, also, I'm able to file a claim and maybe get more money if they don't just automatically do it, which is great. But, you know, when you're when you're in those handshake deals, unfortunately, you deal with some unscrupulous people, potentially, and then you have no real recourse. Right. Uh, and I feel for people when that when that happens. Right. If you're doing something that's non-union and they tell you that it's going to be played in Tallahassee for three weeks and then you wind up seeing it all through the uh, football season um, being played at every commercial break and all you got was two hundred dollars. <sighs> yeah, that's crappy. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think it's also important. Perhaps sometimes a lot of people are working with people who aren't really familiar with working with voice actors. And I, it's incumbent upon us to educate them. Look, if you're yes. going to do this, if you're, you know, this is what I charge. If you're going to rewrite the copy, you're going to have to pay me again. And you're, you know, and that sort of thing. And that, and that does happen. And sometimes they appreciate it. And other times they just go find another talent who, who doesn't know what they're talking about, uh, which is kind of important. One of the other things that, that, that I found fascinating, you did for when, we talk about demos a little bit here on the show uh, mm -hmm. and everybody needs to have a demo, you know, a commercial mm -hmm. demo and that sort of thing. Don't get it too soon, but don't get it too soon, which I think is, you know, your, your point, but you did your own animation demo. So I of. did, I, I, I did. I wound up um, having a conversation with a director that I worked with a lot in New York. And I said, y you're pretty familiar with what I'm capable of. Um, we just did a show where I did three characters for you. If you were to receive a demo from me, what would you want to hear? What kinds of characters would you want to hear from me? And he gave me a list of like, oh, the young dad, the teenager, the uh, fantastical creature, throw in some dialects, da -da 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 -da. and I wound up writing myself some copy. 
Um, and while I was doing a production of Avenue Q in Phoenix between New York and LA, I had doctored up my closet and recorded uh, my demo with a Shure PG42 USB mic. Great mic. And then uh, brought that over to a friend who has a career in radio um, in, in Phoenix. And he basically put um, music and sound effects to it and uh, just sort of rolled from there. And it's it's worked for me okay. I mean, I was able to pick up the agency that was my number one choice agency, things like that. Um, but my, my commercial demo was professionally produced. Um, I've gotten two of those done over time. Um, my, my big thing for people is really trying to advocate, like, don't, don't rush into it. Don't decide yesterday that you're going to be a voice actor and sign up for the two-week course that gets you a demo at the end of the course yeah um yeah have faith in yourself and your ability to grow and just take a little bit more time take a little bit more time so that you don't spend a crap load of money because demos are not cheap um and you don't want them to be cheap necessarily you want them to be quality you, you don't need to pay a car for it but find something that is of a level find demos from from a demo house that you like ask your friends who are in the industry who they refer uh, or, or prefer um just recently i wound up emailing my my commercial agent to say hey are there um commercial demo companies that you love i've got some friends who are looking to get commercial demos done um and i got a list from him then you get people who have experience in the industry who have thoughts on it right but if you jump in premature or if you give kind of a crappy quality or not because you didn't try but because you don't have the knowledge and that's what you're sending out to people uh, you might be doing yourself a huge disservice because you only get one chance to make a first impression absolutely um and if they if they hear it and they're like oh my god this person is incredibly green then even if you get remarkably good you dedicate yourself for six straight months to studying every day and studying with the best teachers and reading the best material and listening to the best um podcasts and everything like that and, and you just rise above, right? You've gone from, from crawling to sprinting in terms of your talent level. You've got this elephant in the room of that first interaction that they had with you where they're like, uh, I don't even know if I want to listen to this. It's only been six months and da 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 hmm. Yeah. Our guest once again is David Arrigo Jr. Uh, Who talks too much. Well, that's, that's okay. Now, that's why you're here. You're the star of the show. That's the most important thing. We're here because we want to hear what you have to say. If you've got a question for David, uh, throw it in the chat room right now, and uh, we'll get to that in our next segment. And uh, we can talk about some other cool stuff, too. So stay tuned. We'll be right back with David Arrigo here on VoiceOver Body Shop, and we'll be right back after these messages. Yeah, hi, this is Carlos Ellis Rocky, the voice of Rocco, and you're watching Voice Over Body Shop. Well, hello there. I bet you weren't expecting to hear some big voiced announcer guy on your new orientation training for Snapchat, were you? Stick around. You don't want to miss this. Look what you made me do. Power 103.9. At Target, we want you to come as you are. Be comfortable. Uh, okay, maybe not bathrobe comfortable. Pants for the customer in aisle four, please. Nuevo México necesita un cambio. La representante Michelle Lujan Grisham ha luchado por nuestro estado en la Cámara de Representantes. Watch anywhere, anytime on an unlimited number of devices. Sign in with your Netflix account to watch instantly at Netflix.com. The ice cream maker is a big risk that can have huge rewards until you forget to turn it on. Well, that's it, guys. Time is up. Hey, it's JMC. Thanks for watching the voiceover body shop. If you're demo ready or looking to get there, check out jmcdemos.com and see a sample of our work. Now let's get back to Dan and George and this week's tech wisdom. Oh, hi. 
You know, as voice actors, we need to hear the clear, transparent, and honest sound of our voices without artifice and affectation. Now, Harlan Hogan's Voice Optimized Headphones 2.0 provide both that accurate, transparent sound with enhanced mid-range audio, less bass, and the creature comforts voice workers deserve. And then, be one of the best informed voiceover performers in the universe by getting an autographed copy of VO Tales and Techniques of a Voiceover Actor for free when you buy our acclaimed voiceover optimized headphones 2.0. And here's how. Go to voiceoveressentials.com sales page, click the Add Both to Cart button, and put them both in your shopping cart and enter free book in the promo code field and click or press the Submit Promo Code button. Your discount will appear immediately. This offer is valid only while supplies last, so don't wait. Thanks, Harlan, for creating the best headphones for voice actors out there. Getting into VO is quite an accomplishment. And accomplishing anything in the world of performance can be really tough. Getting great information is tough. Getting the right advice and mentoring is tough. Simply getting ahead is tough. And the best way to get ahead is to simply get started. Let's make it simple. To get started in voiceover, the best way is with VO Hero's free online course, Getting Started in VoiceOver. You'll learn everything you need to know to create a successful, satisfying, and profitable voiceover career. The link is really simple. Here it is. VOHeroes.com forward slash start. Again, that's VOHeroes.com forward slash start. Get ahead in voiceover simply by getting started. Go to VOHeroes.com forward slash start. This is the Latin lover narrator from Jane the Virgin, Anthony Mendez, and you're enjoying Dan and George on the voiceover body show. Our guest is David Arrigo Jr., currently starring in the new Phineas and Ferb movie and all sorts of other stuff. Have you done any games? Have they asked you to do any gaming voices? Um, I have. I did this game with uh, Tom Keegan, who's one of my just absolute favorite directors. I think he's brilliant. Um, called Archangel VR, and I played ah, the yes. the voice of the AI in that game, and uh, that was a sort of model after. Um, oh, Alan Tudyk in I Robot. Ah. Am I supposed to have feelings? You know that sort of oh, yeah, yeah. Well, AI. That, that's who great. Winds up, um, learning to become more human throughout the game. That was the fun challenge of Archangel was that this AI starts out cold. And then because he's mind melded with the uh, player character, um, he becomes more and more human in terms of his experience in the world. Uh, I also did a game, it was another VR game with Tom uh, through Skydance Interactive. Hey, love him. Uh, called Walking Dead Saints and Sinners. Um, if you are a How to Train Your Dragons fan, I was the player character in um, Dawn of New Riders, I think it was called, um, which came out for the major platforms, and the character was called Scribbler. And that was a fun one, because uh, there, there, there were very, very few bits of spoken dialogue, so it was all, huh, ha, oh. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's the oh, fun. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. the fun stuff um, in games. Is like, could you at least like die for us a couple times? It's like, okay, yeah. yeah. Um, I was one of the player voice choices for um, Final Fantasy Seven, no, 15's expansion, Comrades, which was fun. Um, I was the narrator voice for a Gigantosaurus video game. Um, over here in the savanna, we we finally see all of these dinos. You know, that sort of <laughs> fun stuff. Uh, very yeah. happy narrator type thing. But yeah. that was a cool project. I kept seeing uh, Margaret Tang Schaefer, who was the director, do uh, posts of different languages because they they translated this thing into, I want to say, eight or ten other languages. And so I did the English recording first, and then she she would post these these videos of of people speaking other languages on instagram and so i kind of knew what the tone they were going for was because they were trying to match my vibe but then hearing it in a different language i just was like this is neat <laughs> we got a lot of questions here from our vast worldwide audience you ready to pick on some of these yes okay george take it away all righty 
first one in the queue that our great chat room moderator Jeff has put in there is from someone that's got a lot of questions. So we'll see if we can get through all of them from Nicholas Clements. Uh, first one is how do you get over the stigma of listening to your own voice? Hmm. Ooh, um, I think exposure, uh, almost like, what, what do they say? Immersion therapy or a ver <laughs> what is it? Um, where if you, if you listen over and over and over and over and over, eventually, I don't want to say you go numb to the problems that you hear, but you would, something is likely to adjust in your brain to where you go, oh, okay. It's not so bad. It's not so bad. It doesn't sound like what's in my head, but it does sound like me and the me that I'm familiar with now. Because the only reason that, excuse me, I assert that the only reason people don't like hearing themselves is because they're so used to a different version that they've got in their brain. So if you can expose yourself to your actual voice as it's heard out in the world, you will start to acclimate. Um, humans are, are incredibly capable of, of mental adjustments, right? And behavioral adjustments even. Look at how quickly uh, people decided they could stay home and it was okay. Yeah. <laughs> at least a handful anyway. Yeah. <laughs> it's good to get out once in a while, but yeah, it's okay here. Yeah. Uh, another one from Nicholas. Um, is it more difficult to replace the voice of an already established character, I guess, versus creating a new character? Um, yes. Uh, I'm not saying that it's impossible, but it is more difficult because you're trying to honor someone else's choices. You're trying to honor someone else's vision of something. And I, I think that that's really important. You know, when I'm, when I'm playing Ferb, I'm trying to think, is this how Thomas might do it? And that's why I've watched the series a couple of times, so that I have a familiarity with uh, sort of some of the rhythms, some of the cadences, uh, 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 the pauses that he might make, or, you know, instead of him being like, ow, ouch, is funnier and more in character for, uh, for him. But if you're creating something out of the ether, if you're the guy, right, the, the person who comes up and you know, it's going to be the character. He's going to be like this. <laughs> you get to do it however you want to do it every time. And it's being informed by your little noggin. <laughs> You're not trying to match somebody else's version of it. All right. That answers uh, Veronica Addis's question, which is, can we hear you speak in characters first? <laughs> oh, so well done. Yes. <laughs> You've done, you've answered questions before they're even being asked a few yeah. times, which is awesome. The perks uh, of talking too much. <laughs> exactly. Um, I know this one's from Melly Grant. Um, and she, this is it's a question for all, all three. From so, Scandal? I don't know. <laughs> it's, like, it's a character on Scandal. Sorry. Oh, really? All right. Maybe yeah. she's messing around. President's around. wife. Well, there you go. <laughs> That's <laughs> funny. Um, and this is something we, this gets a little more, this is techie stuff, but you know, you deal with this as well as everything else. Um, Dan, George, Dan, you've spoken a, before about studios making crazy demands of their actors. Such oh as yeah. Source Connect we're, Pro. We're going to get into that. Yeah. And we're going to talk about that later. I've run into a number of projects that only want actors submitting if they're using specific stuff like this mic and this interface. Um, in animation, we do like having a consistent sound across the talent, but how much is too much to ask for a work from home actor. So yeah, we, we're going to expand on this later, but I, what, what are you seeing come at you? And even now that you've been doing this a while, do you, do you get demands that are like, really you guys like <laughs> seriously, do you get that kind of thing? You know, I, I have seen some of that stuff, but I've also been incredibly fortunate that I've kind of leaned into it a little bit. Mm. Um, when all of this happened, I, purchased a booth in March. Um, this Sennheiser 416 that you see me speaking on was a purchase during this because for me, I thought uh, commercial is probably going to work faster than animation during this whole pandemic because there's going to be a lot more learning curve for figuring it out for animation. So before um, that, 
What did you have? What did Before you go that, from to to the to where you have now? I was in my closet using a Shure PG forty two yeah, sure. that I mentioned earlier, and I right. used this bad boy for eight years. Um, yep. But the pandemic hit, and I I picked up the Sennheiser. I picked up a Neumann U eighty seven AI. I picked up um, an Apollo Twin. I picked up an advanced audio CM87 because I was curious about the clones and how they sounded. And by the way, I recorded them side by side and they sounded exactly the same <laughs> for a $360 mic versus Thank you a very $3, much. $200 mic. <laughs> um, uh, but the reason that I made those choices was sort of twofold. Um, they were, they were purchases that I was likely to make eventually anyway, because I, I, I like gear. I like to play with stuff. I like to uh, have fun with it if I can justify it. I didn't feel like I could justify it yet. And then, of course, we all started working from home and I was like, well, I'm going to buy it eventually. I'm just going to go for it. And I'm going to hope that that helps from a psychological factor from the client side, because, you know, we do have places that are uh, sending out auditions that say we prefer a u87 or a uh, or a 103 um for any any of our games or or whatever what what have you and uh i thought you know not everyone is as interested in the technology as as the guys that are here obviously so knowledgeable some of these clients will hear buzzwords, right? They'll hear Neumann and they'll assume that that's quality, right. whether or not it is ideal for a home setup or, or whatever. So you're sort of playing a little bit of that psychology. If they're not doing the research to know that you can get away with a CM87 and you can sort of set yourself apart by having the official Neumann microphone, it's an expensive way to hedge your bets. <laughs> yeah, but it is yeah. a way to hedge your bets for some of the less educated folks that are um, actually able to stop you from getting a job, unfortunately. Right. I mean, I, I have found that if they said, do you have a TLM-103? Well, of course I have a TLM-103. No, I'm not telling them that it's sitting on a shelf, <laughs> but, you know, it's, uh, you know, it. They can't tell the difference. And if they, you tell them, you know, my favorite thing is tell them you have an Alfonso D. Credenza and, and, and see if that will, you know, like, Oh, that's pretty impressive. Cause if it's just the sound of the name of it, then, but if it all sounds the same, who cares? And anyway. I mean, the time, the time you don't want to fart around is probably if it's like a, the audio producer from said triple a game, mm -hmm. that may be the time you probably right. get the real thing. Right. Well, I had, I had one, uh, game studio that was far more persnickety uh, once they had hired me and we had to do a lot of adjusting, um, to, to get them exactly what they wanted. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Jim McNicholas. Now this is a very interesting question because you talked about this a little bit, uh, earlier, uh, it says for an aspiring voiceover talent, how does one get the initial agent meeting? I usually say be by making a lot of money. But I take it there's probably more to it than that. <laughs> I mean, I, I think that that's an incredible help, right? If you can, if they can look at you and their pupils change to dollar signs, that's going to be a really, really <laughs> easy, uh, <laughs> easy sell, right? Like, oh, yes, you are already working and we don't have to work that hard to get you more work. But if we do, we might get you even more work and we can have money from all of it. That's awesome. Um, but beyond making a ton of money, having a solid body of work, I think, can help because some of the stuff that you can do uh, before you're making a ton of money is reasonable quality, right? And if you've got a, a few great things that you can, you can mash together and tell them, like, yeah, I did this and I worked with this person, know who's in the industry, establish relationships with people in the industry um in terms of casting directors and and directors and things like that and if they can give you a referral that's going to be one of your best best ways to get that agent right if you're in a workshop with uh colette sunderman and and or or meredith lane or someone like that and they 
say, oh my God, you're really good. Who are you? What agency are you with? Oh, I'm, I'm not with, I'm not signed with anybody. Uh, oh, <laughs> okay. Um, I'm going to make some calls for you. That's where you want to be because then the agents are going, ha ha the person who referred them is that much more likely to hire them, which means we're that much more likely to make money together right. than if it's done in a vacuum and, and we don't know who you are. Um, and if you don't feel like you could show up and compete in those workshops, then as hard as it is to say, you might not be ready for the agent because once you get the agent, you're going to be competing at the highest levels. You want to make sure that when you show up, you you are conditioned and you are ready to play in those pools. Absolutely. So don't rush it. Don't worry about getting an agent right away. Make sure that you're getting good. And then when you are so good that you are undeniable when you have that meeting, you know you're in the right spot. Yeah. We got one last question here from South Africa. Where it's very early in the morning. Uh, South Africa. Is that yeah. how you say it? Uh, <laughs> South Africa. South Africa. Yeah. Um, do you do vocal? It's from Jacques Arendt. Do you do vocal cord warm ups? Um, I do. I sing classic Sinatra. There is an album that I have uh, yeah, basically baby. used as a warm up for years. And I used it when I did musical theater, too, because it's it's easy on my chords, you know. I've got the world on a string, sitting on a rainbow, you know, and I'm just singing along with that. And it's gently getting things moving around in there. And if I know that I have to do a particularly high voice, once I've done about, I don't know, five or six of those songs, I'll switch over to some of the higher musical theater stuff that I know, because uh, a, a vocal coach named Katie Agresta, um, who's a vocal coach to rock stars, she was the vocal coach for the guys who did um, Jersey Boys. Um, when I was auditioning for that show, one of the things that she really, truly advocated was um, know your music backwards, forwards, sideways, upside down, every which way from Sunday, because then you'll know how to sing it if you ever have a problem. And that vocal familiarity creates really great pathways for the warm up, because I know if I'm pushing in a weird way or what I need to address or things, things of that nature. So I, I stick to classic Sinatra, especially if it's just going to be conversational. Um, and if I have to go a little higher, I'll pick some of the songs that I used to use for musical theater auditions that were higher up there. And that helps me to navigate, making sure that I'm up and awake. All right. Well, <laughs> yeah, you are one intense guy, David. Uh, <laughs> You, you and, and you are a consummate professional because you're showing everybody that if you want to be in the game, you got to study it. It's you've you've got to understand what it is that you're doing. Or, I or, think. Uh, go ahead. No, I was just saying, I was quoting that line. Work, work. Yeah, <laughs> Angelica. Oh God, somebody ruined uh, part of this for me. Not ruined, but it's very funny. Um, whenever you hear uh, uh, Hamilton, no. Alexander Hamilton, Alexander, say Adam Sandler. And that is a very funny way to listen to the album. Oh, think Adam Sandler. Whenever, whenever they, they say, say Alexander, Alexander, Adam Sandler, Alexander. you know. Um, okay. <laughs> it's funny. Right. It might ruin it. And I'm That's sorry right. if I did for anybody. Ah. But, um, you got to work your butt off. Yeah. I mean, study, study, work, work, work. You know, we, we see it too with, with various fields in acting, right? People get into it not to be actors, but to be famous. And that's not you what can it's kind about. of smell those people in the room, right? Because they don't have a respect or a reverence for the work that other people have done to get there uh, and for, for the work that it takes to truly get there and thrive. Yeah. Um, if you love this, that's the, that's the really funny thing. And this was something that I learned in my transition. If you love what you're doing, none of it will feel like work. Everything that you're doing will just be honing tools, developing uh, 
ways in developing different approaches to things as opposed to I'm not going to lie when I was doing musical theater because I I didn't it, it wasn't the thing that I was supposed to be doing taking a class would have been a burden right it, on my time on my finances that's how my brain would have processed it but everything that I do for voiceover feels like it's what I'm supposed to be doing. I used you, you hear that that adage in in performance, you have to learn to love auditioning. <laughs> You're full of it. Um that's how I thought when I was doing musical theater. I was like nobody likes to audition. You are a confused person. And um then I started auditioning for voiceover and whether it was um check gentlemen for a PayPal commercial, or, well, we're gonna go down there to the moon, or whatever. <laughs> I loved it. Yeah. Anytime I could get in front of a mic, I loved it. I, and I still do. I, I get that um, Christmas Eve feeling when I know I work tomorrow. You know what I mean? Um, I think of music that way. I, I came from a music background. But I knew I was not destined to be a <laughs> performer. I, I've heard him play. Be <laughs> I, I, I knew I wasn't destined to be a performer because I didn't have joy every time I picked up the trumpet. Mm. I played, I enjoyed it when I was in an ensemble. I got to play with some people and that was fun. But the guys that I know that are great musicians and, and I, again, translating to voiceover, the ones that love to pick up that horn and wood, what do they call it? Chop wood or woodshed or shed. Mm -hmm. Get you in know, your thousand hours, ten thousand hours a day. They 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 can't do it. Can't not do it. Yeah. They that's what it is. Yeah. To well, love something like yeah. that. Yeah. Well, David, it has been a pleasure having you on the show. I can't oh, wait till we can actually you. all meet in person one of these days. But we're all, <laughs> yes. Uh, we're all stuck here in our cages. But uh, thanks so much for being on the show. You've been a, a great guest and very interesting. And uh, and I know people got a lot out of it. And we look forward to having you on again. Thank you so much for having me. I would love to come back and I'll be listening for all those tech things because it's worth it, guys. It's a, another way to learn. All right. Here and we're... you can wind up saving yourself some money. That's the <laughs> most important thing. Try to do that. All righty. All right. We'll be back to wrap things up right after this. You're, You're watching, watching VOBS.TV. I don't know why. It's crazy what they do here. I think I'm going to go somewhere else and have a cheese sandwich. As a voice talent, you have to have a website. But what a hassle getting someone to do it for you. And when they finally do, they break or don't look right on mobile devices. They're not built for marketing and SEO. They're expensive. You have limited or no control. And it takes forever to get one built and go live. So what's the best way to get you online in no time? Go to voiceactorwebsites.com. Like our name implies, voiceactorwebsites.com just does websites for voice actors. We believe in creating fast, mobile-friendly, responsive, highly functional designs that are easy to read and easy to use. You have full control. No need to hire someone every time you want to make a change. And our upfront pricing means you know exactly what your costs are ahead of time. You can get your voiceover website going for as little as $700. So if you want your voice actor website without the hassle of complexity and dealing with too many options, go to voiceactorwebsites.com, where your VO website shouldn't be a pain in the you-know-what. Your dynamic voiceover career requires extra resources to keep moving ahead. Now there's one place where you can explore everything the voiceover industry has to offer. That place is voiceoverextra.com. Whether you're just exploring a voiceover career or a seasoned veteran ready to reach that next professional level, stay in touch with market trends, coaching, products and services while avoiding scams and other pitfalls. Voiceover Extra has hundreds of articles, free resources and training that will save you time and help you succeed. Learn from the most respected talents, coaches, and industry insiders when you join the online sessions bringing you the most current information on topics like audiobooks, auditioning, casting, home studio setup and equipment, marketing, performance techniques, and much more. It's time to hit your one-stop daily resource for voiceover success. Sign up for a free subscription to newsletters and reports and get 14 bonus reports on how to ace the voiceover audition. It's all here at voiceoverextra.com. That's voiceoverxtra.com. Hey everybody, it's the time of the show where we get to talk about one of our long-running and great sponsors, Source Elements. 
the creators of Source Connect and a laundry list of actually other tools that are on their website. If you go to sourceelements.com, create your account. First of all, you got to have an account. Once you have that free account, start poking around on the website. Source Connect is, of course, the thing they're known for that allows you to work with all the best studios and producers in the world from your studio at home. But they have a lot of other interesting tools, including a meeting tool, which is, you know, if, if you're sick of Zoom for whatever reason, <laughs> just don't even like saying the word anymore. They've got a tool on there for free that will do what essentially Zoom does. Um, there's a, they, they have a lot of interesting solutions. But the thing you need to have at this point, if you're serious about voiceover and you know that you're going to be gunning for those bigger, uh, bigger budget jobs, very good chance they're using Source Connect to produce that. So they want to record you real time and hear you as you sound right off the mic. And so you got to have that ready and get it going by going to source-elements.com, getting a 15 day free trial. You don't have to buy it right now. Just get that trial going. So you have all the, the machinery in place and the systems dialed in and the ethernet plugged in and those things. So you're ready to go when the session does pop up. But anyway, we appreciate uh, that su support now from Source Elements after several years of their support of the show. Thank you guys. And we'll be right back to wrap up and tech talk right after this. Before time began, there was VOBS.TV. Watch or else. All right, we're back to say goodbye. We got Tech Talk coming up after this. If you're watching live, we'll have it on for you next week because next week it'll be Tech Talk number 41, believe it or don't. Uh, of course, I can't believe it's the middle of September for crying out loud. We're, it was just <laughs> May. Anyway, uh, who are our donors of the week? You got it. Well, top of the list is our old pal, Larry, Larry Hudson. Hudson. Hey, Larry. Uh, Natasha Mashuka. Uh, Marshevka. Sorry. I will not get that right, will I? Uh, Thomas Pinto. Trey Mosley. Philip Sapir. Christopher Epperson. Michelle Blanker. Antland Productions. Graham Spicer. Michael Kearns. 949 Designs. That's a Lee, Lee Penny. Yeah. Uh, Shauna mm -hmm. Payne and Baird. Stephanie Sutherland, Teresa Daniel, not yep. Perry, but Teresa Daniel, uh, Patty Gibbons, and George Whittem. That's George A. Whittem, my dad. Thanks, everybody. We really right. appreciate that support. Yeah, absolutely. Well, uh, we need to also thank our amazing sponsors like Harlan Hogan's, Harlan Hogan's VoiceOver Essentials. Uh, voiceover Extra. Source Elements. VOHeroes.com. VoiceActorWebsites.com. And JMC Demos. All righty. Well, uh, thanks again to uh, Jeff Holman doing a yeoman's job in the chat room. And Sue Merlino just pecking at that keyboard and making it happen over at the control room, which is about three feet from me. Uh, hey, folks. <laughs> and she does a great job at it. We thank her for that. And, of course, Lee Penny for being Lee Penny. Well, we're racking up Tech Talk, so stay tuned for that. And... Uh, you know, this is not an easy business, but we bring you great people like David Arrigo Jr. He, great advice there. So you know you're going to get it here uh, on our show. So that's going to do it for our interview this week. I'm Dan Leonard. I'm George Whittem. And this is VoiceOver. Body Shop. Or VO. BS. BS. Have yourself a great week, everybody. See you for Tech Talk. Good night. <laughs>